The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, um, welcome to the ADI and JC webinar. The topic this evening is about the driving test changes and your feedback so far. This webinar is going to be recorded, uh, so it will be available on the website in the next few days if you want to go back over it and revisit any of it. We don't want this to be just a one-way street with us talking about what we think. We want you to participate with your feedback and your questions. On your control panel, which is probably on the right of your screen, you should find a panel marked questions where you can type in your question or your comments and we'll pass them around, we'll give feedback on them, discuss them. And I'm now going to pass over to Lynn Barry. Hello everybody, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight, weather uh, permitting and everything. We're just grateful that everybody's here and we've got Lynn with us tonight. This could be complicated, hey, Lynn, with Lynn. <laughs> um, shall we go over why we want this feedback in the first place? Because we're three months on now um, from when the practical test started. Um, we know that the DVSA are asking for feedback. They've asked pupils and candidates who've taken the test now, whether they passed or failed, um, to complete a survey for them and to get their feedback. Um, we know that at some point in time they'll be getting ADI feedback as well. They're already getting feedback from the associations and NASP have certainly given feedback to date. Um, what we perhaps haven't have, and we don't know, but I'm sure it's going on, will be examiner feedback because they'll be giving their feedback as to how they feel. Um, and to be honest, I think once we've got all this feedback and probably um, in another month or two's time, certainly six months on, I think we will have enough feedback then for them to, if they need to make any decisions about anything or any changes to any of this, then they've got the opportunity, I guess, do that. What we haven't had as yet are any DVSA statistics at all. I haven't seen any of those. Um, and of course, in the long term, we have no idea how this will impact yet on those stages. So we're in the very early stages. So your feedback absolutely vital. I've travelled around the to local association meetings, um, and also we've had Sue Duncan ask there is a lot of people writing in with not only queries, but their feedback. So we are gathering a lot of feedback. I'm also talking in April, six months on from when this first started, at the Young Driver Focus event in London. Um, and that's the talk that I will be giving. It's about, it follows on from one that Leslie Young is giving about the test, and then mine will follow on and give ADI views. So it's really important for us that we do get your views and your feedback. So please do join in tonight. We've already had Okay, James, shall we um, move that on? We know that the driving test changed because we've got the independent drive with the sat nav, we've got car parks, we've got pulling up on the right and then reversing back, and we've got the show me, tell me changes. So this is about each of those things and experiences so far. And also, if any of you had any experiences with just the reading of the signs, um, rather than anything to do with the sat nav, then again, we'd like your feedback on that as well to move that on, James, for us, please. Thank you. So really, um, just as a sort of little bit of background here, um, let's have a look at about that NAVs, what the National Standard for Driving Cars and Light Vans actually says about the use of that NAVs. If you can, James, to help you. OK, so what it's saying is that um, routine check they would need to make and what they must be able to do. Hopefully you all can actually see that. I need to read that out, James, or can people see that for themselves? Hopefully they can see it. That's fine I then, okay. Yeah. So can you move that one on? Yeah, so I mean, whilst you need to be teaching your pupil how to be able to programme and put in themselves where they want to teach, you know, where they want to go to. That's not actually then part of their test to do that. We all know that now. Personally, I have sat in the back now of tests that take place the new test. So I expect to having sat in the back. Probably not as much as you because I don't teach that many times. 
Can you move it on for us, please, James? So this is the part that really the candidate on the day needs to be able to do. This is to monitor and respond appropriately to instructions provided by the SatNav system without being distracted from the driving task. So that's why it's been put in there. And that's really what they've got to be able to do. So let's see what sort of you know comments we've had about that, what sort of feedback we've had on it. What feedback have you had been on? Um, there's been a few questions asked. Um, one is, can we, can I leave my own sat nav on um, whilst the examiner puts their sat nav on? Um, the answer to that is yes, you can, but it must be have the volume switched off, and also it shouldn't be able to distract the pupil at all. So they can have it on if they want to. I don't know why they would want to, but. They can have it on running in the background as long as the volume's off. So that was one of the questions I got asked. Um, another question was what controls can the um, pupil ask to change on the sat nav? Mm. So there's two, two controls they can change. One is if they want to have it in 2D or 3D so they can be changed. And also some people prefer a different aspect to having it just flat 2D and some prefer the 3D aspect. You can also change the volume, ask it to be put up or down. So that's another thing that's changed. Some examiners, we understand, are actually asking the pupil where they would like them to place the sat nav. I don't think this is happening at every centre, but from what I understand, some examiners are actually asking. So that's quite nice. Um, Problem is, in this case, if the examiner does ask, you've got to know where you want it put. There's no point in just sitting there going, oh, I don't know. So perhaps if you know that's happening in your test centre, perhaps prepare your pupils for that so they can make a decision. Um, I think that's really it on these sat navs at the moment. Although we did find out that apparently um, some examiners have been leaving their sat navs in the cars and they've not been working because of the cold weather. So um, that might actually affect us as well. I don't know if some instructors have done that as well. I think that is the instructors, some of them have left them, they've left them in the cars and then the cold weather has just uh, meant that they've almost gone flat and they're not working properly. So we have had quite a few people with um, a few queries on the sat nav. We've had feedback on the sat nav. We've had people say that the sat navs weren't working once the test set off. One ADI said that the sat nav broke down three times and the examiner pulled over three times and sorted it out. Um, but at the end of the day, that, that after three times and it didn't work, they actually gave up on that and went back to directions. So obviously, this was early days then. So hopefully these sort of minor things are getting sorted out. But of course, all that's taking time up on the test and can be a bit off-putting for the candidate. We do have, I mean, we could send out this to people. I'll just hold it up so you can see it. This is actually in a test centre, um, in one of the test centres. So it's all the settings for the SatNav, exactly how the DVSA will use them. Personally, I hadn't seen that anywhere else, but an examiner somewhere has obviously put it up in the test centre. So we have got that if anybody did want um, to see it and have a copy of it. Anything else on the sat navs that, that you can think of, Lynn, that anybody's been asking? Uh, we, we've just had another question come in, um, and it's regarding speed limits. The speed limits on the sat navs are actually showing differently to the speed limits on our cars, which I think we probably already all know, don't we? Um, yeah. But they, they are advising the pupils that they should be using the speedo and not the sat nav because some pupils pupils are looking at sat navs and they don't need to look at those just look at their speedo and the examiners are well aware of the um, differential so yeah that's a question that's just come in apart from that I don't think I we did, have any sorry in my area I did notice that when I was using a sat nav on a lesson that the speed was varying but it varied by sat nav was saying that I was in a, a 60 and actually we were in a 40 and it's been a 40 for a long time so we do need to really watch that. 
um, because we don't want pupils relying on that at all. So definitely what you've just said to watch the actual speedo and, and not the, the speed on the sat nav. It's there as a clue and a hint if they get really lost, but it's um, on speed. But it's not to be relied on. I think we've got to make that very clear to them. On the whole, from the feedback I've had, people have been saying that the sat nav section, although it's caused a few issues with um, setting it and where they've been putting it, etc., it's not actually caused that much of an issue on the, the test. And I haven't heard yet, anyway, of anybody that's actually failed anything to do with the sat nav not being able to do it. No, I've had so good reports back, I have to say. Awesome. I have heard there's been a few little moans, but in general, the pupils seem to be liking the sat nav, which is the main thing. And they seem to be understanding it. I think one little thing that I came across was um, quite often the sat nav will give you an instruction 300 yards turn left 300 yards turn right and there will be a road before that so the pupils mm. have got to get used to looking glancing at the sat nav just to make sure it's not the next left um, so it's it's good and useful for the pupils to get used to this because it's real life driving it's what they need to do yeah, in the future. The the comment from one of the examiners was, I wish they'd learn where 300 yards, 400 yards, etc. actually <laughs> is. And that's a good point, isn't it? Yeah. Because some of them, as soon as they hear it, think they've got to do it. But that's all going to come with training and it will, all of this will move on. But in general, I don't think that the issues we've had have been to do with the sat nav. But if any of you are listening and want to ask us any questions or know differently, then we really honestly do want to know. One comment, you move came up, one comment that came up from a pupil the other day, um, mm. and actually I hadn't thought about it until they said it, was uh, it said 300 yards, and the pupil said, Lynn, what is a yard? Mm. I don't know yards. No, exactly. exactly. 91 centimetres. That's quite interesting. Mm. Which is true because the way they're taught in school now, they won't know what a yard is, will they? So, it, you know, it, it is it, that is something that they're going to have to be trained to do. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Can we change that one on, James? So just basically then we're saying that what your pupils need to know is how to program the sat nav at some point so i've been making mine put their own address in and then we drive back to there or to somewhere else um, interpret the information match it to the road which is what we're talking about with the distances um, to look at the signs on the road as well and try and link them together with the sat nav um, is it an aid or is it a distraction it was put in this test as a distraction really um, but if it's used properly, obviously it can aid their driving in as much as it helps them with their route planning. Um, teaching them when to look at it, what to do if they go the wrong way, and to look but not to touch it while they're, they're going along. Those are obviously the sort of things that we need to be teaching them. Um, have you had anybody say anything about if they've gone the wrong way in with the sat nav on the test? No, oh, luckily I haven't had that happen yet but um i'm sure the sat nav re reroutes them straight away as long as they do it correctly there doesn't seem to be an issue with it as long as they do it correctly um it's really the same as the old instructions there's no difference there um yeah. they used to be told to turn left and they'd turn right so there is no difference really too much there and the d1 the examiners sorry the examiners guidelines do actually say that if they go off route first of all the sat nav will probably reroute them but if it doesn't that the examiner will take over linking to that there's been a comment um saying sat nav says keep left when it's a turn left so that is presumably getting used to interpreting what the sat nav says relating it to the road you can actually see ahead and working it out just sometimes it will perhaps be misleading or hard to yeah. understand yeah Locally, we have one that comes up, it's a junction to the left, but the junction to the left is actually on a bend, and the sat-nav actually says bare left. So yes, we do need to signal, so it's just getting used to using them and understanding the terminology. 
Having talked to the ADIs, though, who have sat in the BAT more than I have, they say that when that happens, um, the examiner has stepped in and, and told them what to do. You know, that it is it is actually a junction and they'll need to react as if it is a junction. So I think where at the beginning, especially where there were issues, the examiners are stepping in. It's, it's not there to catch them out, is it? It's, um, it's no. there to sort of... Um, and we've always said the examiners will step in if they need to to help. Yep. Okay, thanks, James. Can shall we move that one on? The car park, Lynn, do you just want to go into any questions that we've had on the car parks? We've had a few questions on the car parks. Um, can examiners, this is one that's come up, can examiners use non DVSA car parks for the reverse bay park? So, in other words, are they doing the reverse into the bay at the test centre or are they doing it outside? Um, as far as we know, and the blog that was sent out by DVSA said that they will only use test centre car parks to do the reverse manoeuvre, the reverse into a bay. Um, we would be interested to find out if there are anybody, anybody that's had different experiences to that. Um, so, if anybody knows of anyone that's had a reverse into a bay outside the test centre. If they could let us know, that would be useful. It would be good feedback. But according to the blog, they should be doing the reverse in the DVSA car park. The forward bay is being done out on the road. Um, apart from that, we haven't any more questions on the reverse or the forward drive. Can we just clarify the forward one is being done in car parks out and around, but yes. also haven't had definite incidences there where it's been done at the end coming into the test centre car park. I thought the DVSA had said that if they needed to use their own car park for that manoeuvre, they would do that. Yes, yes, so they would, they can drive forwards into a DVSA car park, can't they, at the end? Some test centres have always done that anyway, so. Uh, the question is, and there's something that actually I'm not sure about, are they then being asked to reverse back out of it again, or are they just leaving it in there? Mm, I don't, don't know, that'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, I think that's one um, that we need to... I'm just making a list here of questions. It's one that uh, came up really only today. So um, we'll find that one out. Do they have to go back again? Um, I don't know whether you've heard of people having real issues with car parks, but some of the issues that I've heard about are particularly where they have the, I think they're called locking light cameras, where you can't go back in after until two hours later. Um, so some ADIs were using a car park at the beginning before a test and the test is going into the same car park. Um, and if you're not careful, it's going to be the ADI that's going to get the ticket there because it will be their car that will be seen on the camera. And there have been instances of that happening. We've made DVSA aware of it and they've been saying they've made their examiners aware of it. Basically, I suppose it's ADIs so we've got a test that day and that our parks are specific ones are being used, then really we'd be better to keep out of it in case the test goes back in. But that, I can see how that could be an issue if you get an instructor who has a test. You know, I know some instructors do tests and they are quite close together if the car was going back into the car park. Um, we have well, that also... Be, yeah. Sorry, Lynn. That would be an issue if the exam... No. If an ADI had two tests in one day as well, wouldn't it? So an ADI may have two tests, one after the other, and they may both use the same car park, so that could also be an issue. I don't know how that would work. Okay. It's not happening very often, or it hasn't happened yet, but it did occur to me that possibly that could happen with the same driving instructor car, because another examiner might not realise. But I have to say, no. in my own area, the examiners have been quite helpful and quite clever really on finding some totally new car parks that none of us had even really used before in the area. Um, they've gone for example and liaised with the local football club 
who don't need their car park in the daytime. It's totally empty. And so that's being used on tests quite a lot. But they have put notices up to say that if ADI start using it, that facility will be withdrawn straight away. So up to now, it's obviously still working and I hope it does. But I think they've been really quite clever in finding new places. They've liaised with some pub car parks um, and the owners are letting them use the car park in the daytime up to a certain time, up to sort of lunchtime. So the early morning tests are tending to use that car park. Um, so from some points of view, that in our area, the examiners have done quite a lot of work on finding new places to go, which is pleasing. But from feedback, I'm not sure that's the case everywhere. No, I think it's going to be an evolving thing as well, because I think um, they're going to have to keep revolving round car parks. They won't be able to use the same ones for a long period of time. So I think they will need to be keep going out and looking for new car parks so that they can use them at different times, um, which would be interesting. And the examiners, that will keep the examiners quite busy going out and speaking to all these people. And of course, the pupils have definitely got to practice coming in and out of them because um, when I've sat in the back of tests, it was actually quite amazing that on the one test I sat in, we passed seven no entry signs. Um, and three of those were actually in the car park that we entered and came out of afterwards. So, I mean, it was just a joke between my candidate and myself afterwards that, you know, gosh, how many no entry signs did we pass today? Because I honestly, I don't think we've ever passed that many before. But of course, with car parks being used as well, I've really got to understand way in, way out and, and follow it carefully. Uh, my candidate wasn't given much help on that other than to avoid the potholes as he was coming out because there are a lot of potholes on the route out. Uh, but he wasn't obviously told which way to go. He had to work that out for himself. It's keeping an eye on the one-way system. Yeah. The car park one-way systems, they must be very aware of it when they go in because some you can go in and out the same way but some are a one-way system and they must be aware of that yeah yeah definitely um we obviously we are getting still um ADIs who are finding it hard to find car parks and i do have some sympathy with you know certain areas i think probably do have a lot more issues than say the area that i'm in but I also do feel that some ADIs need to broaden a little bit where they're looking for car parks and try and think of some different places to use car parks. I know I did before um, I started this when the new test came in. I found some new ones and some different ones. I think feedback at local association meetings as well that ADIs are beginning to know where some of the car parks are that are being used and, you know, um, in some ways avoiding those so that we keep out of the way of the examiners. Yep. Can we move that slide on, James? So obviously the key points were the choosing the parking bay, uh, managing the risk related to other car park users, um, safely reversing and then their move off to exit the car park afterwards. So those are all points um, ready for them to be able to take successfully and use car parks afterwards. So forwards or reverse, which bay they're choosing, and of course not test, but just to teaching our own pupils about the first in car park, any valuables that they leave in the car. Park. Uh, can we move that one on? Okay, so the bow on the right and then the reverse path. Have you any questions then that we were asked? Um, yeah, we've got a couple. Um, there seems to be a few people that get in a pull up on the right on a 40, uh, 40 mile an hour zone. Um, mm. There's quite a few ADIs that are commenting on this and aren't, they feel that the, the roads that, aren't, they're be, that are being used aren't really appropriate. Um, I think with those cases you need to speak to the test centre manager, the local test centre manager because it is different in every area i'm sure i know i've in my area we have 40 mile an hour roads that are suitable 40 that aren't so i'm presuming that the examiners are being sensible with what they're using but 
there are a few ADIs that aren't particularly happy with where they're being used, in which case you should really um, approach your test centre manager and speak to them about it. Yeah, I mean, certainly the pullover on the right was the one item that we did have quite a few ADIs at the beginning and feedback that they weren't happy with it. Um, that this was even before the test came in, obviously. Um, but the trials were carried out. We seemed to um, come to the conclusion that, you know, it was going ahead. So we embraced the pullover on the right and the reverse back. Um, but yeah, we are still getting people who are saying that the roads that they're being done on, in their opinion, are just not suitable. Um, and that is one of the things that people are writing in with issues on. I mean, it's true what you've just said, Lynn. I've got roads in Litchfield where I live where it's 40. And yes, I would pull over on the right and then reverse back, be quite happy to. But there are other ones where I definitely wouldn't want to. And we've had some people write in to say that once they pulled over while it was quiet, but then it became so busy that it took them a long time to move away. Um, and we've had another query where somebody said that the pupil had put a signal on because they couldn't see any gap. So they signalled in the hope that somebody would let them out. So a signal to sort of show their intention to want to move across. And the examiner had said that was the correct thing to do. Um, what's your thought on that, Lynn, as, a, as an examiner or a past examiner? It's, it's a hard one because you need to be there to see the situation. Um, I would expect a pupil to put a signal on if they were, if there was a lot of traffic because they would expect to, how is someone going to know that they want to pull out? Someone may then want to let them out. Um, no, I don't know. That's a hard one to comment on. I don't know what else was happening at the time. Um, no. that again, well, one I would have to be re referred back to the T um, LDTM, so the local test centre manager. I think start with the local test centre manager, but then we are also aware of these as well. So we will be feeding this back. And it is just about the suitability of the roads and the fact that some ADIs are saying this, that this is not safe on that particular road and they've not felt that it was fair on the test. Um, so that's something that we will feed back. It's an area where we are getting people challenging it. Um, but I think start with the local test centre manager and then come to us and then obviously we are giving that feedback as well. I've made a note of our questions and I'll ask that question then, Lynn, about signals and just say, you know, is it, what are they doing with that? Um, because it's, it's the fact that some examiners are saying one thing and some are perhaps saying something different. But as you say, if you're not in the actual situation, you don't know the whole picture. Very hard to judge a picture without seeing it. So there could have been perhaps a push bike coming along, maybe. There could have been something there, I don't know. So it's very hard to say. First port call is always te uh, test centre manager. And then, as you said, Lynn, approach us. If not, come to us and speak mm -hmm. to us. But um, yes, it, this is the one area that we seem to be getting a lot of of comments on this out of all of the new tests I think this is the area that we seem to be getting quite a few people commenting on um, the other comment we've had is how can we pull up on the right in the dark mm. um, the highway oh. code rule number 248 says that we must not park facing the oncoming traffic with our lights on so I think this is something we need to address I, personally I've got a pupil that works up in the city she only comes home in the evenings and i've been teaching all over the winter um we haven't haven't been able to uh, do a pull over in the right so it is actually a problem i don't work weekends um because <laughs> i'm always away doing njc stuff um but so i've had to actually um arrange for to work a saturday just to take her out so there is a little bit of a problem with this and i think we do need to address this somehow I have to say, when I did bring this up with the DVSA, that was their reaction that we need to come up with solutions and plans, plan a way around being able to help people at a different time. Because um, you're saying that you would not teach this at night, aren't you? And yet I've, which I would agree with, but I've seen ADIs out there who clearly are. So I, I've got a bit of an issue with this one as a, as a safety thing. There are some areas in um, my local area where 
they are they're on the road but they are designated bays over on the right so yes, yeah. you could use somewhere like that but there aren't that many of those in some places you don't have anything like that at all um so i, I it's the issue with the, the night time and the only answer that I, i've been given really is um you're going to have to come up as adis with solutions to it i mean to be honest it doesn't take that long to teach this um and in fact i quite in some respects i've quite enjoyed teaching it because there's an awful lot to this one and um, it's amazed me how much really the the pupils need to really think not just about the move over but where they position and then the looking round and the moving off again it's quite a demanding maneuver in actual fact um so i've i've enjoyed doing it but i i haven't had a test yet um myself where i thought that the road wasn't suitable or heard of um roads being used in our area that aren't suitable but i do know not too far we have had a comment in relation to this one, and it's, mm. hold on, it's, a, sorry, just lost it. Um, it says, Chief Police Officers Council say it's okay. Most people are not happy though. Uh, you can pull up on the right at night against the flow of traffic in designated parking bays and turn mm. your headlights off. Yeah. Um, and and um, adding another point, it perhaps is dependent on the road. So if you may be in a very quiet estate and you are thinking about turning your headlights down to side lights, maybe it could be done there. Maybe, yeah. Not, not ideal, but have to take it some way. Yeah. There was also, I mean, it's it's probably worth just oh. mentioning, before the test started, um, there so. was um, a video... Sorry, there was a video of um, somebody who was parked on the right in a lesson and um, an accident that occurred with a car that was coming towards them. Um, and I've watched the video, I know you have, Lynn, and I've watched it a few times. And to be honest, I mean, the, the conversation between the ADI and the pupil was, and they suddenly stopped talking and then the conversation went, gosh, have you seen how close that woman is to that parked car because there were parked cars in front of them? Um, she's getting way too close and then oh and bang and she had gone into their car as well but i have to say i would want to know the whole story to that before you could say that it was because the adi was parked on the right because she's been way too close to the other cars before that and to be honest if it's an eyesight issue some that could happen left or right but i know a lot of people were concerned about that dear We've had another comment which may actually provide the perfect answer. I'm surprised none of us have come up with it before. To teach right side oh, pulling at night, you use a one way street. <laughs> Simple, yeah. isn't it? Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Haven't got um, very many, but yeah. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. a good, yeah. yeah that's good. Um, um, but I haven't got very many that we can use, actually. Yeah. How do we stand, how would you stand reverting back to Carlins? I can't see that's an issue actually. I can't see it's an I issue. I can't see that's an issue. I have to shuffle yourself into a space anyway, so I can't really see no. that that would be an issue. No. If you want to go into the highway code rule that you shouldn't reverse any further than is necessary, but you could actually argue that on any roads, does, is any reverse necessary on a test or yeah. lesson? Mm -hmm. No, that's that is an um, excellent answer. Well, well done, that person who spoke sent that in. Well done, well done thank you. Well done, Martin Loveridge. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, just in case anybody's wondering why we have these black and white photos on here, um, just to say, you know, that these were taken. I don't know the exact date, but the top one was the final uh, position of the car on the very first driving test, wasn't it? Um, it was nineteen. That was in the nineteen thirties. 1930s. I'm right? sure it was the first time, but that was in the 1930s. And the bottom one is from the 1960s. Right. I think that top one is actually where the position of the car ended up on that uh, famous video that we've all seen of the driving test. It ends up on the right hand side. So we would change and look, people have been doing it forever and more. So, um, no, it's all been going on. But, um, we are taking on board the fact that some of you are still having issues with where it's being done. I think, 
you know, if the DBSA thought that this was being unsafe on roads that we don't feel are safe in our area, then, you know, we look into it. Definitely. Can we move the slide on, James? So, where to stop safely? Straight line reversing, managing the risks, moving off safely, then considerations for passengers getting in and out. That's not for the test, but for the power actual teaching and then what to do at night, which we've discussed. So we can move that one on, James. Show me, tell me questions. We know that that's another area where we've got um, a new section. So we've got one tell me at the start and one show me whilst driving along. Have you got any comments or questions? No, Lynn. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Two questions have been sent in. Um, do the pu uh, does the pupil need to turn the controls off after they've operated them? So, in other words, oh, if, yeah, sorry, no, go on. Yeah, in other words, if they've put on the re rear demist, do they need to then turn it off? Um, and the answer is no. They don't have to. So, if they've opened the window, do they need to close it? Um, but the rear do miss, no, you don't need to turn it off unless you wish to. Um, personally, I teach mine to put it on and turn it off. Um, I hadn't really thought to just leave it on because I wouldn't leave it on if I wasn't using it. Um, so I think that's personal choice. If you want to let them teach, uh, leave it on, that is absolutely fine. Um, another on, question the on the test I sat in, on the test I sat in, Lynn, um, one of them the pupil was asked to do the rear screen and then he said to the examiner do you want me to turn it off again and the answer was that's up to you so he did actually turn it off so i suppose you know as you say it depends does it still need to be on for a purpose is it helping in any way then leave it but if you don't want your window left open or something then common sense tells you to shut it again i think it's up to the pupil really to make that decision and that's what we should be helping them to understand exactly um my car for instance if they put the front if they clean the front windscreen that will turn itself off if they mm. uh, clean the rear windscreen it doesn't turn off they actually physically have to turn it off now i wouldn't want that to run in the whole through all the way through the test so they do need to turn that off mm. so it's personal preference, but I, I will still carry on, I think, teaching them to turn off as well, if it's safe to do so. If it's not, leave it on. Um, yeah. no, another question was, some cars have a front demist button as well. So as well, as long as, um, along with the rear demist, they have a front demist rather than having to turn all the knobs. And the question was asked, can they use a front demist button instead of having to turn the knobs? And again, the answer is yes. So if you've got that facility, you can use it. And likewise, you can leave that on if you need to. We have had incidences where people have said that their pupils failed, not because they um, didn't know where the item was, but because it became unsafe while they were trying to use it. They actually took their eyes off the road to try and use it. So I've, I was surprised at the beginning um with some pupils how much it did distract some of them i mean obviously we've always gone along and done things like the cleaning of the front windscreen etc because you've, you've had to um but it it you know when i've done some mock tests with mine i've noticed that it it does seem to throw them a little bit to have to do it on the move but that's no bad thing because it is a distraction uh, but we didn't know that some candidates have failed on that because of the feedback that we've had but not, you know, we're not talking excessive numbers here. We don't have the statistics yet. It's just interesting to get the feedback back from ADIs. And I think perhaps we need to be a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit earlier, perhaps, and getting them used to using them for a longer period of time rather than leaving it until just before the test. Yes. Yes. Yeah, definitely. The sooner the better, really. Yes, definitely. Um, one of the things we've not mentioned, um, because it came under SATNAVs actually, uh, were routes that were being used. So we have had a lot of comments on routes and the fact that although at the beginning when this was introduced, we were told that it would help us go out further and mean we could have more fast or flowing roads. So we were expecting routes to change. A lot of feedback that suggesting that the routes aren't changing that much at all if 
if at all. Have you got any feedback on that, Liz? No, uh, we've in our area, in my area, they, there are a few new routes. Um, but likewise, some of the older routes are being used as well. Uh, whether that's because now they've got recordable sat-navs and they can actually just drive a route and record it, I don't know. Um, but no, we've got a few new routes, but not all of our routes have changed. Or some parts of it have, but not much. Mm. So, fair yeah. comment. I think, and I have heard this did a lot from a lot of pe people across the country. So, yeah, I think of all the comments that we've had, that that's the one that we've received the most on the fact that the route, some of them, well, not many of them have changed that much at all, and some of them have been on quite sort of slow little local roads. So uh, that is something as well to be looking at. I mean, there could be reasons for these sorts of things. We don't, you know, we, we don't no. know, um, but. Obviously, once this is up and underway and they're happier with the sat navs, then maybe they will start to change uh, some of the routes and we will start to see the routes changing. I I'm think that question will be a NASP. Do. I think that question will probably be a NASP question, maybe, Lynn. Take that to NASP. Yeah, the and route, yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. It's on, it's on my list. I think we might well ask before then, but it's definitely on my list for that meeting for sure. Yeah. Anything else on the show to tell us? That's worrying anybody. Hmm. Have we got any other questions, um, James? That anybody wants answering? Uh, no, no other activity. All right. Okay. Well, let's move to the next slide, which was just about um, manoeuvres that are no longer being used currently on the the test. So the turn in the road and the reverse around the corner. Um, and do the pupils still need to learn them? Um, and are you still teaching them? I mean, personally, I am still teaching the turn in the road because I think if they get on a test where there's roadworks or an accident or something happens and they've got to turn around, they're going to need to be able to do that and show that they can do it. If they've never done it, they, you know, they're not going to know really what to do there um, and the reverse around the corner i'm not doing it in quite the same way um but we do go down into places where you may have gone the wrong way and you want to turn yourself around so let's just back around this corner um but i'm not doing it to the same sort of degree that i would have put it before that's just my that's just me speaking to me as an adi that's what i've been doing um I'm, I'm the same, Lynn. Um, I've still been teaching turning the road. Um, in fact, I teach that first before I teach the yeah. other manoeuvres. Um, I've always thought it was a fantastic clutch control exercise, still do. Um, I think it's a very useful manoeuvre. Likewise with the reverse, probably not so much. I'm tending to use that a little bit more local to their house. So if we've got a reverse near their house, I'm doing it to turn the car around. So instead of stopping them outside their house I'm taking them down and reversing around the road and then coming back but again not to probably the same degree I used to um, but definitely the turning the road I'm still using a fair bit <laughs> every pupil I think and we know these are still actually on the mark sheet but when we queried that we were told it was because of the cost of you know a single change on something costs well more than thousands of pounds so that's why it's still on there at the moment but um they are both still there and you know i don't know maybe if anything happens in the future i don't know whether any of these will come back again it seems not we'll, we'll see because with this feedback hopefully we can look at this um practical test and if any things are needed to it. It seems to be going well at the moment. I went to a local association meeting and just, you know, with a, a really large group of lady guys and the feedback was it's all the fuss about, we're enjoying it. Some lady guys are saying it's actually they've been teaching the other test for so long. It's actually been quite nice to do something new and they were really enthusiastic about And then the usual um next bit was about car parks and what they were going to do and who they were going to about car parks, but, you know, that sort of thing, which the issues that probably at most local associations and meetings. But, um, in general, yes, we have had people who've been in with issues, but in the main, we seem to be getting really good feedback on the test. 
got two comments about these discontinuous manoeuvres. Um, yeah. one, one is like just a yes exclamation mark that they are still being taught. And another comment, um, always teach it, should still be tested. Um, well, some people um, always did say that they would have preferred all of the manoeuvres to stay in. So, um, you know, that's a we can take all this feedback back and we will. Um, so, yeah, that's a comment that I've heard as well. Another suggestion, even if it's under one in five tests, that's not sat nav. So it could just be selective, as you're saying, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. possibly. Yeah. It's another good suggestion that could go forwards to NASP, isn't it? Perhaps that maybe people would prefer to have all six in and yeah. have one the choice out of the six rather than just the four. So perhaps that's a comment to pass forward. Although, does that bring us back? I don't know, I'm just trying to look at this from the other side. Does that bring us back to um, having to spend a large proportion of the time in lessons on teaching manoeuvres, whereas actually we want that time to be more on the road um, from the safety aspect, because we know that that's where the accidents happen. Um, you know, I can see fours and against, I can see it from both sides. But isn't it both? Because even a, a crash in a car park, the cost of a mirror, the cost of a bumper, they can run into several hundred pounds or even thousands. So even like the low one, it's not killing anybody in most cases. The um, the less serious crashes do still cost a lot of money and have consequences. Yeah. Can we just and move that on to the next slide of the NASP survey, James, as well? Sorry, Lynn. It's fine. Do you want me to do this and then come in? But um, we have got a survey at NASP. It's on the NASP website. Um, if you go on the NASP website and go into the surveys, then um, we would like as many people to respond as possible because it gives you an opportunity again to put your ideas down in writing. And then um, it's quite a quick survey, but at least then we can start to gather some figures together of how people feel and their opinions about this. We'll leave the proper statistics to the DVSA as far as test passes etc um, but we would like to know your feelings on it so if you could fill that in it's running into sort of mid-March so it's not going to run for that long it's already been open for a while we sent it out from NJC so the DIA and MSA are sending it out as well so hopefully we will get quite a few people responding to that so that we can get views if you've not filled it in please do Sorry, Lynn, were you saying something? No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, any other questions, James? I think that's probably bringing us to an end of it, unless you want to tell people what we're going to be doing next time as well. Well, the next webinar is on the 28th of March. Details should be on the website soon. I'm not going to give you an exact time, but soon. Um, the subject will be safeguarding. Do you want to say anything about what that involves? Give a teaser. Some um, people might well, I think, you know what the yeah. thing is. Um, this is about really the fact that we have a responsibility to anybody that is a child or is vulnerable, and a child is anybody who's under 18 years of age, so therefore as driving instructors, we do have responsibilities there. Um, it's about um, safeguarding as a respect of perhaps the client opens up to us about something or perhaps we hear about something unsavory about another ADI or even an examiner um, or um, it can be safeguarding from other aspects. I think it's really important that we know what to watch for, what to do if somebody does report something and how to handle it really. So we can play a huge here um, because people do open up to us and I think it's, big, it's a rare thing but I do know from cases that we've been going to the NJC um, of APIs who have gone out that they just want them all day and then suddenly they find something happens they start get into trouble and they need help um, so safeguarding covers all sorts of things. Is something that we're going to be um, looking at 
that's at our March meeting as well at this weekend. And also we'll we'll be doing some um, hopefully helpful items about it. We can put them in the newsletter. We all need to know about. As a teacher, obviously I used to understand safeguarding because as a teacher you needed to in school and you had some evidence to go. If you on any school, it'll have a safe policy. They will have somebody to go to the designated safeguarding. As ADIs, we fall slightly out of that bracket of people. We are not teachers in schools, but actually we do sort of have the same types of responsibilities. So I think it's definitely something that we need to be very aware of. Lynn and I and another one of our team of safeguarding courts for the school. One we did. Um, it was an online one, um, but it certainly updated me, made me think again and made me realise the responsibilities that we need to understand. So that's what the next webinar will be about. Do you want that's to say anything, Link, as you did your question? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say to, the 28th yeah. is actually a Wednesday. Because yeah, we normally do our webinar on a Tuesday, just so that people realise yeah, it is going to be a day. Oh, right. OK, yeah, sorry, I can't do the Tuesday. I'm already that's somewhere right. else that day. Yeah. Um, just okay. so people realise, because I think they might miss it because it being on a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday. Okay, right, we're going to be a bit flexible then. Anything else, James? Or is that, are we coming to an end? Any other questions? Um, well, this is one that will perhaps be answered on Wednesday the 28th. What about safeguarding the ATI from the students? But presumably you answer it, talking about it on the 28th. Um, another yeah. question is, can you manoeuvre the car on the driving forward into a bay, e.g. just out a bit to correct it? And I believe the answer is yes, unless you have any other additional I knowledge. I think the answer is yes. I've also looked in the D1 and, and also asked Graham O'Brien um, at the DBSA, and you can go over lines as well, can't you, Lynn? Yeah. Yeah, which some ADIs are very clear on. Presumably, it's a question of like how much you cut over lines or how close you get to other vehicles, how much you have to adjust it as to whether it is not marked at all, driving fault or serious fault. Yes, yeah. Um, it, it's just got to be a shunt. As long as it's just a small shunt, a corrective movement, that's fine. Um, unlike my pupil yesterday, who asked if when we'd driven forwards into a bay and I told her to reverse out to exit the car park, she said, can't I just drive forwards through that bay and straight out the car park? Well, that's common sense. <laughs> no, that <laughs> was the answer. <laughs> Unsurprisingly. Okay. Thanks, James. Thanks for organising this for us, James, and running it tonight for us. Okay, so I think we come to the end. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Thanks everybody and thanks for taking part tonight. We've recorded it and then we will put it onto um, the website shortly. And we look forward to joining you on Safe Bodding, which is the next topic that we'll be looking at. Thank you. Bye Thank now. You. Bye. Bye.